All right, so our next speaker is CEO and founder of Hashed Health, a healthcare tech innovation company focused on accelerating realization of blockchain and distributed ledger tech. With 20 years of healthcare tech experiences spanning across many successful startups, he is also a proud native of Nashville as well as a Tar Heel. So without further ado, let me introduce John Bass. All right. Hey, how's that sound? Can everybody hear me? Cool. Uh, this is great. Thank you for being here. Thank you for coming. Um, I'm going to move pretty fast. Uh, don't worry, I'm not going to do a blockchain 101. I um, assume if you're here, you, you know uh, how the blo what blockchain is and um, how it works. Um, I am going to talk a little bit about healthcare and why blockchain is important and how we hope that it can empower consumers and become a tool uh, for us to change the system. Um, you know, everyone complains about the healthcare system, and it's certainly a topic of conversation right now, but it actually is working as designed. I don't know how many of you have read uh, Homo Deus, a great book if you haven't read it. Um, Yuval um, Harari talks about it pretty well in there, basically says that you know, for the first time in history, more people are dying of uh, overeating, kind of eating too much than too little, and more people are dying from old age than from infectious disease. Um, we've really been successful at creating a system that keeps people alive, that, that um, fixes acute care illnesses. Um, we are really good at that, and we've built up these massive insurance companies and uh, pharma companies and uh, a lot of different middlemen in between, EMR companies, um, that have uh, done very well because of that system. And it's been successful in a lot of ways, but the problem is that it seems to start, it seems to be going a little bit backwards in terms of quality. We rank number one in cost, but number 37 in terms of quality. And, um, and it is eating away all of our GDP. Uh, right now, we're looking at about 18, uh, close to, climbing close to 20% of GDP, and by 2020, the estimate is that it will be around $5 trillion in healthcare costs. It's basically eating our government. Um, over time, there will be little room for much else other than healthcare. And the waste uh, is, is pretty substantial. Um, the estimate is that 25% of those costs are in, uh, administrative waste. About a third of that $5 trillion is, uh, is waste. And it comes in a lot of different forms. Um, according to the NIH, uh, services, um, basically needless services are the biggest piece at $210 billion per year. Uh, administrative costs is at 190 billion, uh, inefficiencies, pricing transparency, fraud, and and the failure to prevent uh, diseases um, continue uh, in terms of kind of making up that 25 percent. Um, the the leading killers in our country um, are heart disease, cancer, and medical errors. Medical errors are the third largest contributor to death mortality, morbidity in the country, according to the CDC last year. Um, medical errors kill more people than respiratory disease. And the, one of the kind of central themes here is that our fee-for-service healthcare system actually rewards those errors. You know, if you treat someone and you fail to treat them correctly uh, in the fee-for-service structure, you actually get paid to treat them again. And you keep getting paid uh, despite uh, your success. Um, we're working to change that, but we're still built on top of fee-for-service infrastructure and fee-for-service relational databases and systems um, that uh, are a fundamental challenge to us digging our way out of the hole that we're in. Um, fee-for-service creates these perverse incentives, and, um, and uh, the relational databases create siloed data structures that um, prohibit us from really moving the ball forward in terms of interoperability. Um, and at the same time, most of the people who really need help are, uh, for example, mental health patients, one in five Americans, um, and the really bad ones aren't in 
the institutions where they should be, but they're in jail, or they're in, um, on the streets, or they're in the morgue. And we're realizing that um, you know, while we've gotten really good at treating acute care illnesses, uh, we're really not so good at being kind of uh, treating those leading causes of death like cancer and heart disease and respiratory failure. Um, and because we seem to have over time institutionalized some of those illnesses. Um, health uh, is not about, um, it's about more than the uh, absence um, or lack thereof of disease. It's about your environment and it's about what's going on around you. It's about things like how close to mass transit you are. Do you live in a food desert? And are you generally happy with your situation? Um, an interesting study on rats uh, found that uh, op uh, rats will choose opioids over food when they're caged, but they'll choose food over opiates when they're not caged. A lot of your health has to do, and your tendencies towards um, um, uh, escape has to do with your situation in life. Um, and we know this, yet we continue to um, market opiates and other uh, things that are destructive to health um, because it feeds uh, that system that we've created. Another interesting point is that um, brain studies have shown that sugar is as addictive as cocaine and sugar is you know, the leading cause of a lot of these problems that I'm talking about. Cancer, for example, feeds off of sugar. And the last kind of depressing statistic that I will uh, kind of talk about is um, the, you know, as we start to look at how we're going to change the system, um, we have to recognize that the, uh, you can't read that, but that's the health and pharma lobby on the left. Um, and in terms of contributions to uh, government um, lobbying, financial contributions, um, far outweighs other types of lobbying. So it's really hard to change the system under these circumstances. Um, so. Despite successes, and there have been many, uh, we're really good at knee replacements and hip replacements and fixing trauma and keeping people alive and, and, and treating people when they have certain types of cancers and heart disease and things. Um, my grandfather is 100, turned 107 years old a couple weeks ago, so there's a lot of good that we can do for people and there's reasons to do that. Um, but we can't afford it, and it's, no, it's, it's starting to become weak in terms, of its, in terms of its ability to deliver quality to the patients who need that care. And we are clearly headed for a crisis in terms of the, how much it all costs. We have a system that worked well for a while uh, and has become a, a big, ugly baby that we need to um, now take care of. So we're at 20% of GDP and we're starting to go backwards. How do we fix it? Well, certainly there's a lot of noise coming out of Washington um, on, and on how to do that. Uh, but we really seem to be struggling with it. Um, I, I am not making any kind of political statement here. Um, Obama's tried and um, the new administration uh, is finding that um, things are a little more complicated than they had realized, maybe. Um, and we all seem to be headed towards a, uh, what, what, you know, both sides of the aisle seem to be pointing towards a single-payer system where government runs our health care. So what, are we gonna, what do we need to do? So I, you know, what I would believe is that we've got two paths. One is to do that, and the other is to change the conversation and empower the patient, empower the consumer. And unfortunately, in our country, it seems like crises uh, are what's necessary for us to really start to change behavior and open a new door. Um, but I think now is the time that we can do that. And um, certainly there's a lot that would uh, be required, but I believe that um, one of the fundamental things is how do we start to re-envision a foundational architecture for the value chains that exist in healthcare and the consumer's roles and responsibilities, the consumer's position in their own care and in the care of their communities. Um, so I'm going to talk about how blockchain can help. 
And uh, when I say blockchain, uh, I'm not sure how many kind of blockchain philosophers we have in the audience, but for right or wrong, blockchain has become a term that encompasses what I consider a spectrum of trust-based transactional systems. Um, there are public and private blockchains. Um, there's a lot of different protocols that have been advanced to solve specific issues in blockchain world. And I'm going to, for the purposes of this conversation, lump that all underneath the word blockchain, as many people do today. Um, blockchain, uh, you know, like Bitcoin, it provided a new conversation in terms of moving a currency around. Um, we need a new conversation in terms of moving data and moving health-related data assets um, between companies and between companies and individuals. And the guys who were before me gave you one interesting use case of that, if anyone was here to see it. Um, trust is a big problem in healthcare, and the concept of moving trust uh, from intermediaries and centralized third parties to the protocol is a, is a fundamentally uh, exciting um, and uh, interesting concept um, that we are pursuing. Um, in addition, the idea of taking what's currently building applications across the value chain on top of existing relational databases and using the blockchain as a market level data structure upon which we can build new types of applications is a really exciting concept. And it's a new way to innovate in terms of healthcare delivery. A few of the uh, use cases that we're working on at Hashed Health, um, identity and identity related um, uh, use cases. Uh, in our world, um, there are two different kind of versions of identity that we're working on. One is patient identity, and we've got um, some relationships with hospitals around the country where we're starting to look at first putting a, a core identity and then building out um, uh, extensions of that core identity to look at the uh, patient's um, profile, risk uh, health-related profile for healthcare um, relationships and healthcare transactions. Same thing's true on the provider side. We're looking at core identity and these extensions that are things that currently need to be maintained in, for, in order for uh, physicians to transact business in terms of the today's structure. Health plans have to maintain about 15 different data fields on every physician that is part of their system. That information has to be correct and for, in order for that physician to treat a patient or get paid for that treatment, in order for a claim to be processed correctly. So that's something that is really a problem now. And in, in the future, core identity plus these attributes plus things like um, patient reported outcomes measures and quality scores will be important physician identity related concepts as we look to create future blockchain based marketplaces. Um, so th those are a few examples of identity related projects that we're working on and related to that is also on the IoT side and on quantified self. If you think about it, quantified self is is kind of an extension of your patient identity, right? It's a, it's a health-related extension of, of you as a person, um, and the information that needs to be understood in real and virtual marketplaces uh, going forward in order for us to know how to um, price treatment and things like that. Um, quantified communities, you know, at Hashed Health, we talk a lot about not only the individual, but uh, the community in which that person exists, so ex you know, allowing uh, patients to form groups um, and then look at attributes of the group and allow them to connect to provider and provider groups in new ways, uh, new and innovative ways of aggregating. Um, and self-sovereign medical records, the idea for you as a patient to have your mobile device that has uh, your information on it and opening and closing the door to that data, much like you would uh, a Bitcoin wallet, um, is, a, is an exciting concept rather than having, as you move through an episode of care, each physician you talk to or see opening and closing the door to their uh, EMR platform for you. That does not make sense. It's not sustainable and doesn't scale and doesn't solve the problems we need to solve 
um, today or in the future. Broken value chains, there's a million concepts here. Um, pharmacy benefits management, the pharma value chain, uh, the supply chain. Um, a lot of blockchain-based um, solutions are looking at track and trace and serialization solutions. Uh, I think the larger opportunity in terms of pharma and supply chain is un unmasking the complicated um, and uh, uh, obscure a way that we manage these value chains in terms of payments um, and contracting. Um, for a lot of different reasons over the years, we've built these admin fees and rebate fees and these big intermediaries that sit between businesses so that now pharma companies don't even know who takes their drugs without buying that information from a middleman. So the middle of these value chains has gotten so bloated that no one on either side knows what's happening anymore. And so it's a great opportunity to create more peer-to-peer -peer relationships between the entities who really uh, need to understand that information and um, allow for um, uh, allow f for us to take that value that's currently being extracted and bring it and give it back to the patients. Um, the same thing is true on the value chains for medical records and claims life cycle and a lot of different value chains in healthcare. Those are just a few examples. And then payments and currency, uh, you know, currencies, payments, behavior, and benefits. The concept of programmable value or programmable currencies in healthcare is a very powerful concept. Um, the idea of linking payment to benefits um, is a concept that over time I think could revolutionize the insurance industry. Um, so when you talk about all of these different use cases that I just kind of blew through, uh, identity, diagnostics, uh, these different value chains, payments, that's healthcare. Um, and uh, it's, it's, a, it's a more peer-to-peer, -peer, as you chip away at that, it builds a more peer-to-peer -peer version of healthcare that puts the consumer at the center in a way that also creates this feedback loop uh, kind of around a learning healthcare system. Um, the leading protocols, you know, we, we've done a lot of different projects now. We've got a lot of different relationships that we've got with a lot of different healthcare um, enterprise and consumer focused organizations. Um, in our experience, uh, the leading uh, protocols are Hyperledger, um, Fabric, and Sawtooth Lake. Um, the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance has um, got some interesting healthcare activities going on. Um, obviously, uh, peg, uh, anchoring to the Bitcoin blockchain where you can uh, use a public um, a blockchain as, a, as um, something that you would strive to do. Most use cases that we come across, most people that, use cases that people are asking for, um, at least in the short term, are private permissioned blockchains. Um, I, I hope this is a temporary uh, thing and as things mature, we all migrate towards public open chains, but due to some of the sensitivities in healthcare, uh, especially depending on the use case, um, private permission chains seem, seem to be kind of the default. Um, we are starting to look at Ethermint and Tendermint um, because of some of the things there, and then we are very interested in things like Tezos and EOS um, uh, in terms of some of the newer protocols that are coming along. So we believe blockchain is a good enabler um, for the reasons I mentioned before. Um, I think there's lots of powerful things we can also do around incentivizing uh, patient behavior, whether, uh, and a lot of that could involve using a token. Um, and we are looking at moving towards a world where uh, patients are, are at the center of these collaborative networks that are designed to organize and empower people who both are uh, providing and, um, and consuming health-related services. The idea of prosumers, the idea of you as the consumer uh, using your data to create value for yourself, are, are, those are concepts that we are very excited about, creating new assets, new types of currencies, new types of health marketplaces. Um, you know, everything we do is built off of kind of mass collaboration, and we hope that's the strategy of the future. Certainly, it's core to the blockchain space. 
Um, and we believe that over time, it's going to be really interesting to watch healthcare companies uh, behave and um, think of themselves more like software companies. And same thing could be true for clinicians and research researchers. So now's the time that we can, because of the crisis, because of all this scary stuff that's going on, we hope that now is the time to um, kind of rethink this fundamental relationship that exists not only in our country but around the world in terms of uh, commerce and its relationship to healthcare. Uh, I'd be happy to stick around for a few minutes. If you want to learn more, you can reach out to me. And thank you. Uh, I think we have time for maybe one or two questions. Cool. Uh, hi, thank you for your talk. Yeah. Uh, so there are ways that blockchain, blockchain could change the incentive structures as you described. Uh, for example, we could put a bounty on your future health and incentivize doctors to proactively make you healthier, as strange as that would be. Um, so, but that would require, a change of that level would probably require a long regulatory process. Mm -hmm. So what do you see as the potential entry points for researchers, startups, and, and probably most people in this room um, to uh, start acting and, and changing the incentives now without requiring a long government uh, yeah. approval process. So uh, this was exactly the question I had for myself um, about a year and a half ago when I left HCA to, to start Hashed Health. I mean, how do you create a company in the healthcare space uh, you know, with, with that in mind. And so what I decided was simple demonstrations of value in the B2B relationships were a good place to start. Um, how do we uh, create um, new ways to manage things like provider directories for insurance companies? And now, granted that those, those types of use cases are kind of nibbling around the edges of existing systems, but I think in the short term, those are important demonstrations of value to prove that the blockchain is capable of solving real problems in today's world as we build a foundation for these longer term, more disruptive solutions. So when you think about, you know, there are real problems and identity, both on the patient side and on the provider side that we can solve in the next year or two using the blockchain. There are real uh, opportunities in things like reward systems for health behaviors, I think that we can solve in a, in a fairly short period of time. And then these concepts of identity, payments, incentives, um, start to form the foundation for a marketplace um, that becomes more, more, more and more real uh, over the five to 10 year horizon. Thanks for your question. Thank you.